Well, welcome to the seminar. Today we're going to talk about the uh, topic of breaking the 8 and 16 bit habit using the LPC Cortex M0 products. And uh, we will specifically focus on the LPC 11C100 series, which is our Cortex M0 part with onboard CAN. And it also has the uh, on chip CAN transceiver. The agenda is to introduce uh, the audience to the ARM and the Cortex M0 portfolio. So I'll be doing that, followed by a big chunk of the material which David will be handling, where he will dive into the details about migrating from uh, the microchip PIC-18 to the NXP LPC-1100. Uh, followed by a second example using our own existing 8-bit to a Cortex M0 LPC-1100. And then finally, we will have a Q&A round. OK, so introduction to our portfolio and our kind of a strategy behind Cortex-M series or families. We have a very clear strategy, and the strategy is 100% focused on ARM. So if you go back in time, we come from the ADC-51 world. We were very strong in the ADC-51 area. Um, and gradually, we made our entry into ARM using with the ARM 7 core. Then we brought in ARM 9. And then finally, we moved into Cortex M3. Now, from M3, we have moved over to M0 and also with M4. And today, we are the only vendor who can provide a scalable option from the entry level Cortex M0 32 bit all the way to 32 bit Cortex M4. So key points, uh, performance, innovation. Uh, performance and innovation, I think, are the key factors that drive us uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. When we came out with the first Cortex-M3, we moved the performance to uh, first 100 and then 120. Today, we are at 150. Secondly, um, yeah, the, the innovation in terms of peripherals, I think, is something that differentiates us from the competition, especially when you go to the higher end portfolio, like the M3s and the M4s. Especially now with the Cortex M4, we have a dual core option within the same chip. We also have some very unique peripherals that we call as serial GPIO, um, which is basically uh, helps us to emulate any, I, any serial interface on that, on that particular controller. So for example, I would go to a customer and then they'll say, if only you had one extra UART. Uh, so that serial GPIO block enables us to optimize, basically select go for an, S an SPI or an I2C or UART. We also have something called as a state configuration timer, which allows you to do some very complex motor control algorithms. We also have a spy flash interface that we call Spiffy on the Cortex M4 parts. So the Cortex M0 is, is our entry to 32-bit, which we are saying is the solution for the existing 8 and 16-bit applications. But it's not the entire range, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So here's our complete range. This is what we call has the NXP ARM Cortex-M continuum from M0 to M3 and then M4. Well, where, where does the M0 come in? It comes, in the, it comes into the space which talks about low cost. I mean, talking about sub $1 applications. Uh, low memory footprint applications. We're talking about replacing 8 and 16 bit. Then from there, we have a pin to pin compatible solution from M0 to M3. And here we talk about performance. Here we talk about communication. We talk about USB, Ethernet, LCD controllers. And then finally, we move from M3 to M4, where we bring in floating point, we bring in digital control, we bring in a dual core solution, we bring in advanced peripherals. So it's a scalable solution from, uh, from you know, very simple to use, easy to use, simple parts, all the way to highly advanced Cortex-M4s. So that's kind of our overall strategy. Um, it, it kind of gives you a glimpse of where do we stand today with the, with the full series. So now that you have a good view of the different cores within our portfolio, let's have a look at the families themselves. So here we are again. We have the Cortex-M0, which runs up to 50 megahertz. We have the Cortex-M3s, which have a performance of up to 150 megahertz. And then finally, we have Cortex-M4s, 
which can go over 150 megahertz. So within the Cortex-M0, which is our fastest growing um, portfolio, I would say, within the Cortex-M series, uh, are the 1100L and the LPC-1200. So within LPC-1100L, we have done some really good things. We have brought in really good numbers for low power. When I say low power, I talk about both active and deep sleep. We also brought in a range of peripherals now. We brought in CAN with integrated CAN transceiver on board. We have brought in USB, full speed device, and we have brought in segment LCD. And this is our most recent addition to the, to the series. So we didn't talk about USB uh, this morning. We actually, we had a different uh, second, uh, another seminar about USB. So USB scales very nicely across these three families. Uh, we have full speed USB options here. And then as we go higher, we go to high speed. We go to multiple controllers on board high speed with Phi on board. So you can see that the range of solutions for USB uh, is, is pretty wide across Cortex-M0, M3, and M4. Then when you go into Cortex-M3, we have uh, three main families. We have LPC-1300, which is our entry point. And LPC-1300 and LPC-1100 are pin-to-pin -pin compatible. So today, if you're using a LPC-1100L, uh, MCU in your, in your application, you can do a drop-in replacement with the 1300. And similarly, uh, we will have, we have a pin-to-pin -pin compatible version between M3 and M4. In this case, if you are today working with LPC 1800, you can drop in an M4 on top of that. And it's not just within the Cortex families. If you are an existing ARM 7 customer, there's a very good chance you will find a migration path to Cortex M3. So that's kind of a view of the, the cores and the different families within each core. OK, so uh, let's talk about Cortex-M0. Let's dive into Cortex-M0 a bit, because that's what the presentation is all about. When I talk about Cortex-M0, I talk about five points, and uh, mostly these five points. And they are power, uh, code density, migration path, pricing, and performance. So let me quickly highlight each point. But then the idea is the presentations, for, um, what David is going to do is follow up these uh, points with, with actual proof points based on the analysis. Uh, performance is a, is, a, is, is a given. I mean, we're talking about 32-bit core. So definitely, the MIPS is much higher than a traditional 8 or 16-bit. Core density was a big surprise for us. Um, we saw that when we compiled code on M0 and compared that with a traditional 8-bit or 16-bit, we could go down to, we could get better than up to, I would say up to like uh, 30 to 40 percent in code savings as compared to 8 and 16. And that's, I think, inherent because of the, uh, the thumb two instructions, not just the instructions themselves, but also the ex what you can do with a single instruction of thumb two. Pricing, of course, is a very important factor when we talk about 8 and 16-bit. We're talking about low-cost applications. So that is something we address uh, with, the, with the low price point. Uh, power, so as I said, we, we were actually initially at 150, mega, 150 micrograms per megahertz for active. And we were at 6 micrograms for deep sleep. But then we rolled out a version this year, which took the active power consumption down to 130 micrograms per megahertz and deep sleep down to two micrograms. And we're currently looking at a version where we want to take the number even lower for both active and deep sleep. So there's a continuous improvement program that we are bringing into uh, effect for the 1100 series, because power consumption is a critical factor. But we're taking into consideration both active and deep sleep, not just looking at deep sleep currents. And finally, migration path. Uh, as I said, you, know, you can enter today with the Cortex-M0, but then you will have a migration path to M3s. So here's our roadmap for the uh, Cortex-M0 family, uh, near-term roadmap. Basically, we're talking about uh, Q4, what's coming up, and Q1 of next year. And the way I see the roadmap is, is in this fashion. I mean, I, I look at these different lines. Uh, this is what we are bringing into the this is what we are bringing in to the Cortex M0 family. So lower power 
Today we are at uh, LPC 1100L. We're looking at a solution which will even lower the active power consumption. We're talking about more flash. Uh, today we are at 32K. We're looking at up to 64K of flash. Additional peripherals, we're looking at um, uh, temperature sensor, 10-bit uh, DAC, uh, comparators, and of course we have the CAN. And then we are going to uh, really improve on the USB line. Uh, right now we are at 32K of flash with 6K of SRAM. We want to take this all the way up to 128K. So we're going to really uh, blow up the, the 11 new uh, series with USB. And then we have the LPC 11D and 12D, which brings in the segment LCD drivers. And finally, we have the LPC 1200, which is our industrial control series that today offers you up to 128K of flash. Uh, this series is very unique because it offers you not just the flash, but it's also good for safety critical um, and wide good applications. It's Class B certified, and it's also certi certified by Langer for high immunity on the, on the different I.O. pins. So that's kind of, a, kind of a view of what's coming up in the near future, Q4 and uh, Q1 of next year. So yeah, I talked about the power consumption, and this is just a, a pictorial representation of that. So active, we were at 150, now at 130. Deep sleep, we were at six, now we're down to two. And we have a mode called deep power down mode where you have some state retention that is still maintained at two uh, that is below one microamp. And that's the LPC 1102, which is a small 2.5 by 2.5 millimeter CSP 16 package. Okay, so uh, this is another concept I'd want to talk about, uh, power profiles. Um, so yeah, as I said, power management is something which is very close to our hearts, and we take and we give equal concentration to both active and deep sleep. So what we did with active mode is we introduced this concept called power profiles, which enables you to do runtime management <coughs> in active mode. Uh, we basically have these three modes called uh, CPU performance, lowest active power, and CPU efficiency. Uh, and what you can do is while you're running your application, you can simply call these um, drivers, which are in ROM, and they will go ahead and optimize the application for you. Uh, unfortunately, time is limited today, so I cannot go into further details, but if that is something which is uh, that's something that interests you, if active mode is where your application resides most of the time, then power profiles, I think, will play a pretty critical role in your selection. Okay, so I think with that, I will hand it over to David. Okay. Thanks, Amit. So I'm going to start out. This is, um, this is kind of the same diagram that Amit showed with the different uh, features. The first one that I'm going to cover is migration path. Um, but along the way, we're going to go through each of these different uh, aspects and show how if we are able to do this migration, we can improve these parts of the design. So the design that we're going to practice with today is actually a can open device. Um, it's an 8-bit device. It uses a, an 8-bit controller from a competitor. Um, it's an 8-channel relay driver. So the block diagram of the design is very simple. There is a CAN interface, uh, a voltage regulator, um, the CAN, a CAN transceiver, which then connects to a PIC18 part. And then there's a Darlington relay driver which uh, goes to screw terminals. So it's a little bit of a, um, it's a very simple design so that we can get through it quickly. This is, this is an overview of the features of this 8-bit part that's used in the design. So this is an, it's an older part that's still on the market. Um, if you go through the features of it, you'll see it has 48K of flash memory, 3K of RAM, and 1K of VEPROM. So we're going to have to replace it with something that can hold the same size program, so a program that'll take 48K of flash. There's a CAN 2.0B controller on it, but there's, um, there's no CAN transceiver on this part. Um, there's an internal RC oscillator that's at about 10% over temperature and voltage. This isn't good enough to drive CAN, so in the design, we have to also have an external clock oscillator. This part can operate at up to 40 megahertz, at which it draws 23 milliamps, and it's a 5-volt part. 
there's 36 I.O. pins, but there's no spec for um, ESD on I.O. pins if you check out the data sheet. So um, in an industrial application, usually people like to see a spec for ESD, but not on this particular part. Um, there's 11 A to D channels, four 8 16-bit timers. It has one port that can be I squared C or SPI, and it also has one port that's a dedicated UART. And then the performance of this part, it's about one and a half uh, core marks per second. So this is the part we're gonna look at, upgrading this to a 32-bit part, and then show a comparison of the design complexity and uh, features. So when, when we looked into this, uh, because the design is using CAN, our first thought was to look at the Cortex-M0 family, which is the lowest N32 bit family that um, ARM, it's the lowest N32 bit core from ARM. And then we looked at the LPC-1100 family, which is the lowest N family from NXP that has the Cortex-M0 core. Uh, in that family, we have a microcontroller that has a CAN 2.0B controller built in. Um, and then the controller also has a transceiver on it. So if we were to migrate to this part, we can eliminate the external transceiver from the design. Uh, for memory resources, this part only has 32K of flash. So as, it, as we'll show later, um, 32K of flash is actually plenty because the, the code efficiency on this part is much better than on the other 8-bit part that we were using before. Um, Although the internal RC is 1% over temperature and voltage, this is still not good enough to be able to uh, run CAN at one megabit. So we still have to have an external crystal. Uh, the current is much less at 50 megahertz. The current draw is only seven milliamps at 3.3 volts. Um, and then as far as if you look at the timers and the serial peripherals, it has many more peripherals. So this, is, uh, this looks like a good replacement. Uh, it implements Almost all the features of the other part, except the one notable missing part is EEPROM. But uh, otherwise, it's a good replacement part. And then the core mark performance is much better. So let's talk about code density and performance. So a lot of people think that code density is better on an 8-bit part compared to a 32-bit part. But that's not necessarily true. So this slide shows the registers for the PIC-18, um, which are on this side, and the registers on the Cortex-M0. So the, the main difference between these two register sets is on the Cortex-M0, the registers are 32 bits, and they're, they're, uh, you can use them for whatever function you want for the most part, whereas on the 8-bit part, the registers have special functionality and you have to always use the correct register for the thing that you're trying to do. So there's one working register compared to 13 working registers on the Cortex-M0. Um, and it's, it's only an 8-bit register instead of 32-bit registers. If you want to do a multiply, um, the result of the multiply gets stored in the multiply product register, which is a special purpose register. If you need to access data that's in RAM, you would typically have to set up a bank select register um, if you want to, uh, or a file select register to access RAM. If you want to access data that's stored in flash, then you'll need to use a table pointer register. So on the Cortex-M0, you can use any of these registers as a pointer, and you can access RAM or flash with it. Um, so the main point of this is, I mean, both we both know that, we all know that both of these processors can accomplish the same functions. But on the 8-bit the processor, you typically have to go in a more indirect route, such as through a bank select register or a file select register or a table pointer register to access memory. And this really shows if you compile code and you just run it through the compiler and you look at the assembler code, the result is much different between the two processors. So here's an example of code that copies data from a structure. So the data is copied from this 16-bit field into this 16-bit field. And this is done on two different fields in the structure. So if you compile this on the PIC-18 and you turn on optimization, you'll actually end up with something like this. So 
And then a lot of these, um, there's a lot of values in here, which are access to registers that are for you know uh, accessing pointers to go to RAM and so forth. Whereas on the 1100, generally the data can be indirectly offset. So R0 and R1 are pointers to the structures. And then R3 is the register that's used to store the data that's moved. So it's, the code is much simpler. So you might say, well, maybe my code doesn't always look like this. But this isn't really, it's not especially strange code. Um, it's, it's a typical structure access, which is common to C programs. So if you have code that's written in C, chances are it'll take up a lot more space on 8-bit um, architecture than it does on a Cortex-M0. Here's another example, which is um, a 32-bit multiply. So this is actually, first I made the variables volatile so that they would force a load and a store. So you could see both the, uh, the loads and then the <coughs> multiply and then the store. Um, on the Cortex-M0, there is two load instructions, and then there's a multiply and then a store. Um, the Cortex-M0 <coughs> multiply instruction executes in a single clock cycle. On the PIC18F, this is actually all of this code is to load the data, and then to do the multiply requires all this code. And then the store is these uh, lines right here. So one thing to point out here is this code, the multiply code, is actually a function that is generated inside of the compiler. So it doesn't get duplicated every time you do a multiply. However, this code for load and store, this will get duplicated every single time you do a multiply in the program, and it causes the code size to increase dramatically. Um, and then one more thing to point out is that these instructions, this is uh, three cycle, uh, sorry, these are two cycle instructions, and this is a one cycle instruction, and this is a two cycle. Whereas on this 8-bit architecture, most of these are four cycle instructions, and some of them are eight cycle instructions. So it takes many more clock cycles to do the same work, which results in higher current consumption. This is an example that I put in here because I, I wanted to pick something that normally um, works out better on an 8-bit part, and that's um, toggling bits. Uh, a lot of 8-bit processors have the ability to very quickly toggle bits on I.O. ports, whereas many 32-bit processors do not have the functionality to do this. So on the PIC-18, there's actually a bit set uh, instruction. Oh, sorry, this should actually be a, a bit clear instead of a bit set. There's a bit set and a bit clear instruction and then a branch. So this can be done pretty quickly. But these instructions all take, um, these two take four clocks, and this one takes eight clocks to do. On the LPC 1100 with the Cortex-M0 architecture, um, what we have is in the hardware on the I.O. ports, we have the ability to set and clear bits with just a store. So um, this can actually be done here with uh, two stores and then a branch. But these take fewer clocks, so it still ends up faster, even though there's not a bit set and a bit clear instruction. So to kind of quantify what difference all these code changes make, um, I wanted to find a benchmark that I could compile on 8-bit as well as on 32-bit uh, processors. So there's a benchmark of processor core efficiency called CoreMark. This is from uh, the Embassy Consortium, which does a lot of different benchmarks for, they do benchmarks for networking and motor control and so forth, and they also have one in processor core efficiency. So CoreMark is, it's a self-contained synthetic benchmark of processor core. Um, the results that you get, you usually express in terms of uh, iterations per second that the processor is able to execute the benchmark. Um, the source code is freely available ANSI C. And there's four different types of things that are done in the benchmark. One is uh, linked list operations, or um, data structure and pointer manipulation. Also does matrix operations. So those are mostly 16-bit integer math, but also some 32-bit math is done. CRC calculations, and then uh, state machine control code. So 
these are not terribly unusual things, but uh, people might do these in a typical microcontroller application. Uh, one thing about this benchmark is it, it tends to use standard C types, so it uses 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit types. It doesn't just limit itself to just using 8-bit <coughs> types. And it takes 2K of RAM. So this is a benchmark. I decided to run this on the old processor, the PIC18 part, and compare it to the, um, the LPC1100 part. So looking at the performance on the PIC18 part, in order to get the benchmark to compile, because the memory is segmented, I had to compile it with um, large code and large pointer so that it has a, it has a um, unified memory space on the 8-bit RAM. So when the benchmark is running, even though optimization is enabled, it can only do one and a half uh, iterations per second. On the 1100, you can do almost 51 iterations per second. So what this, this translates to is you can have a much slower clock rate on your 32-bit part, and you can get the same work done. And then uh, as far as the code size, um, code size is 30K on the 8-bit part, and it's 8.8K on the 32-bit part. And then that, that all comes from the ability to, for the compiler to just be able to generate simple sequences of instructions to move data and so forth and not have to set up the, the, uh, the uh, page registers and so forth on the 8-bit part. So, let me go to the next thing and talk about power. So if we just look at the base power numbers, um, the run current is 23 milliamps on the PIC-18-4585, and it's 7 milliamps on the 11C24. And these are at, at different speeds. So the 23 milliamps is actually at 40 megahertz, and then the 7 milliamps is at 48 megahertz. So even at a higher speed, the run current is less. Um, deep power down current, it's about twice as good for the LPC 1100. So. so anyway, so to do the actual migration of the design, it's a it's a five volt design. Um, there's an 1117 regulator on it. Um, we're going to have to change, uh, add a regulator to migrate the MCU to 3.3 volts because the LPC 1100 part is 3.3 volt only. Uh, another thing that has to change is um, we need to use a different uh, frequency of crystal. And here's the new design. So we actually had to add a second regulator. So we have the 1117 for the 5 volts. And then we added a, another regulator for 3.3 volts. This regulator only needs to source about 20 milliamps. So we, uh, we were able to use a SOT23 package, and the part is very low in cost. Um, and then at the same time, we were able to eliminate the CAN transceiver. So there's some cost savings, actually, with the new design. So. Another thing that we need to do on the design is to move some of the pin functions to new pins. So this is actually the Darlington driver, and um, it's, it's using these particular pins on the, the, the microchip part. And then on our design, we move the Darlington driver to different pins that aren't being used for anything else. Uh, and then we have our extra regulator, and then we eliminate the transceiver. So for the PC board layout, there's not a huge change. Um, I mean, we had to relay it out. It's an auto routed layout, so it wasn't too hard to lay this out. In, actual, in an actual design, it might take more work to do the, the relay out. Um, but the, the size didn't change because we were able to get rid of the CAN transceiver, which is, let me see. Here's the CAN transceiver we were able to get rid of. We changed the debug. Uh, connector. This is the debug connector for the microchip part. And this is the debug connector that's kind of a standard for ARM products. Um, so those were kind of the main component changes for the board in the addition of the small regulator. So 
one thing that we need to do is migrate to the new tool chain. So when we developed the old design with the microchip part, we used MPLAB as the tool chain because that's kind of the standard tool chain to use for microchip. Um, for NXP products, um, there is a free tool chain, which is uh, Eclipse Space. It's called LPC Espresso. And that's what we decided to use for this example because we, we didn't want to require people to buy a new tool chain in order to uh, migrate to a new part. So the uh, tool chain, LPC Espresso, include, it consists of an Eclipse Space IDE and also a development board which you guys can get one of these development boards for free here. Um, actually, we're handing out um, some, you can have your choice of an 11C development board, which is the same part that we're talking about in this slide deck. So a few features of LPC Espresso. It's um, Eclipse-based IDE, and there's a migration path to RedSuite. RedSuite is a higher end development tool from Code Red. Um, and I say migration path because they, they actually are kind of the, the brains behind the LPC Espresso tool suite. Um, there's, it includes a free GCC compiler. The compiler does not have any size restrictions, but the debugger has a 128K limitation, which is actually pretty large for a free tool suite. Tool suite. Um, included with LPC Espresso are uh, project, uh, ARM project templates. So you can create a project and say what part that you're creating it for, and then it'll automatically um, make a whole project for you that is ready to download and debug and flashes an LED. Um, we also provide uh, Sensus libraries. These are bundled with LPC Espresso. Sensus is a standard from ARM for uh, all the different ARM vendors to uh, make available their header files that describe the, uh, the registers for all the peripherals on the chip. Uh, also uh, available for LPC Espresso, there's add-on boards for, by embedded artists. So this is, this is like a baseboard, and you can plug the LPC Espresso board into it. And then um, you can, on the baseboard, you get more peripherals, and you can easily get those running without having to build your own board. Um, there's also, for uh, LPC Espresso, it can work with LPC Link, which is included with the board, or it'll work with uh, Red Probe 2. So the Red Probe is a higher performance um, debugger that is available from Code Red. LPC Espresso supports almost all of the um, uh, NXP's uh, Cortex products. This is a picture of the LPC Link debugger. This is um, built into the board that you'll receive today, and it's based on an ARM9. One of the things about LPC Link that's different from a lot of uh, the competitors' uh, starter kits is the LPC Link can be used to debug in another target. So if you make your own board, you can use LPC Link to debug the software on your own board. It's not limited just to working with the LPC Espresso board. And then the, the cost of the LPC Espresso boards is, is uh, $29 with the target and the uh, LPC Link or they're free at the seminar. So one of the things that's always important to point out with uh, ARM-based products is there's many development tools. Um, for instance, for the LPC 11C, there's, uh, in addition to LPC Espresso, there's the Code Red Red Suite. There's uh, Kyle uh, Microvision, IAR uh, Embedded Workbench. And then uh, Hitex also has a tool um, there's an online prototyping tool from uh, ARM called Embed. And then, uh, then there's LPC Espresso, which is the free tool. So that I wanted to talk about, that's sort of a little bit about migration path, because once you start developing with a tool like LPC Espresso, you could move to a Cortex-M3 or M4 microcontroller or you could use um, a different development tool and you get that ability to migrate between parts. So the next step with getting the code going, uh, up and going for the new design, is um, looking at the peripheral libraries and examples that NXP supplies. 
for the LPC 11C, NXP supplies uh, examples for the ADC, GPIO, CAN. Um, they have a CAN example using the on-chip driver, um, a CAN open example with on-chip driver, external interrupts. So th there's many, many different examples, and these are all free. Um, so what you would do to start porting the code would be the first thing you would do is get LPC Expresso and then uh, get the example package and then start choosing the examples that are using the peripherals on the chip that you're going to need to control. Um, but one extra thing that we have is ROM libraries. Um, ROM libraries are free and they work with all the different tool chains for the chip. So in addition, they save space in flash. So if you have a program and it takes 36K of flash, maybe it doesn't fit in the chip but perhaps you can replace 4K of it with ROM library functionality and use our built-in can open driver. So one of the ROM libraries is Power Profiles, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, power Profiles are really helpful for optimizing uh, run power. Um, in addition to Power Profiles, there's a ROM divide. So the ROM divide is in the LPC 1200 family, and this is to address in the Cortex M0, uh, the Cortex M0 family from ARM, the core does not have a hardware divide instruction. So in order to address that, NXP develops an optimized software divide, which we put in the ROM, so all of the tool chains from all the different compiler vendors can use this one optimized version of divide. And this also saves the space necessary to implement it in, uh, in the flash code. Um, also present on the 11C, which is the part with CAN, there's a CAN open drivers as well as a CAN driver in flash. And then other parts such as the 1343 have uh, a USB driver in the ROM. So a little bit about the CAN open drivers on the 11C. Basically, it's, uh, it's an easy to use API. Uh, one of the things that supports is flash programming. So if you get a blank chip from NXP, you can put it in flash programming mode and then download firmware over the, over the CAN interface. Um, there's uh, also, there's two things that the drivers save. They save you space in flash, and they also save operating power a little bit, since the ROM draws slightly less power than the on-chip flash. So anyway, when we, did, when we first did this design, we went and we, um, we priced all the parts out um, through a, a vendor who shall re remain nameless, but we priced out 1K piece pricing. And we ended up saving almost $3 moving from this PIC-18 part to the LPC 11C part. So a lot of this. Where this comes from is um, the savings on the part, it's the biggest thing, and then the second is saving on the uh, CAN transceiver, because the CAN transceiver is integrated into our part. So and that's the, uh, the pricing part that I wanted to point out. So doing this redesign, you can save about three bucks, and then you get um, Lots of, per, lots of extra performance if you need to add uh, any features to your system. So we have another example. This one is um, actually using an 8051 design. This is uh, an app note that NXP has, app note uh, 10338. For, it's a buck converter that is a lithium ion battery charger. This is the original uh, capabilities and schematic of the design. It's a five volt, uh, it runs off a of five volt and it outputs a charging voltage of 4.23 volts and it'll charge a 700 milliamp hour uh, lithium ion cell. So the, the actual question comes up, why migrate? So the 1111 part is actually slightly cheaper than the old 8051 part, but it's not enough cheaper to be the lone reason why somebody would migrate. Um, the key thing to keep in mind is just with the new products, with the new 32-bit products, there's so much more functionality is available that it allows you to add features to your design without having to increase cost. So 
going between these two parts, you can go from 2K of flash to 8K of flash, uh, from a quarter K of RAM up to 4K of RAM, uh, from an 8-bit ADC to a 10-bit ADC. Um, you can also increase the processor performance. So the old part ran off the internal oscillator at 7 megahertz, and now the new part can run off the internal oscillator at 12 megahertz and boost it up to 48 megahertz. So without adding any extra components, you can clock it much faster, and that improves the PWM resolution. Um, and then you get more I.O. pins. So if you, so in the past, maybe this was a lithium ion single cell battery charger, but now it can be, maybe it's like a, an iPod dock battery charger that has a display that does many other things, and it, it can use the same, uh, the same core design. Um, just with the new resources on the microcontroller, you can add functionality without necessarily increasing cost. So this is the, the old part, the uh, 8051. Um, so here's our design. So what we ended up having to do is to change the microcontroller and the, in the inductor and relay out the PC board. And then we went to the code. So the 8051 design was actually done using Kyle Microvision. So that's a third party vendor. Um, NXP is usually very friendly with third-party vendors, so if there's a tool chain that you like, you can probably find that same tool chain on the uh, ARM family. So as it happens, Kyle Microvision, in addition to supporting the 8051s, they also support the Cortex-M0 product, so we can use the same tool chain to build the code for this design. So to start out, we've taken the sample software for the 11C, that's all these different examples that I mentioned before. Uh, sorry, for the um, 11, 14, all these, which is these different examples. Um, and then we select these particular uh, parts that these are basic pieces. So this is a core underscore CM0. This is um, a library that is common to pretty much all ARM projects. Uh, we select the startup code in the system.c. We use the timer driver. So we add all these features into into our project, and that's kind of the start of the code for uh, migrating from the 8051 design over to the LPC 1100 design. One of the things we have going on right now is um, a Cortex M0 marketing campaign. It was really well received, so what we did is we asked people to come up with innovative ways of destroying their 8 and 16-bit board and send us a JPEG or send us a video. So, and. Uh, so if you want to get started, the best way is to go to our website today, which is nxp.com, of course. And then we have a kind of community websites. We have LPC Zone. Uh, this is our website where you'll find a lot of rich media content. You will find videos. You will find um, brochures and all that. And mostly, you will find links to our Yahoo forum, uh, which has got, I think, over 8,000 members or even 9,000 members. Uh, in, uh, on, on Yahoo. So I think it's, that's the biggest MCU forum uh, on, on Yahoo that we have today. And it was started by someone in the UK. So we go there and monitor it every now and then. But it's a very, very active forum. Very active forum. Then we have LPC Expresso. So that is our low cost tool platform, which is, which if you can go, if you go to this website, you'll get the ID for free. Uh, pretty much. It can download code to up to 128K of flash, which makes it a free platform for all our Cortex-M0 parts. The, the board itself, of course, will be giving our boards today. But if someone goes to, the, goes to DigiKey or Mouser, they can get the board for 29 bucks. That's the entry point. And then finally, we have this new website, what we call LPCWare. This is basically an engineer-to-engineer -engineer interaction. So it's, it's by the NXP apps engineers for our customers. So all our software, all our application packages will be on LPCWare. Uh, we'll also be monitoring the forums. So yeah, just, it just it's very new. And uh, yeah, please go ahead, check it out, and post your questions and your comments. And finally, actually, we now have a contest which is uh, just up and running on LPCWare. It's for our LCD. Uh, controller, which is the uh, LPC 1788. Uh, we have rolled out a free graphics library from Segar called EMWIN, 
So, it's, so we have licensed it from Segar, and it's free for all our customers using the NXPM CUs. So if you uh, create an application using our LCD controller with or without EMWIN, uh, you can put that up on LPC Wear, and you will be entered uh, for a contest. I think the prize is like, oh, there it is, uh, Nintendo 3DS. We also have a selector guide, which is uh, an offline selector guide that we have on our website. That's a link for that one. And finally, it gives you an overview of the training videos that we have on LPC Zone. And these, these videos are really nice. I mean, they're short 20-minute videos. So if you want to get a good flavor of what the Ford 300 does or what the 1700 does, just, just go to the video, and you will get a good overview of the entire feature set of the, of the series. And finally, actually, even uh, this, this particular seminar was recorded as a webinar by E Times. So if you go to E Times and look at the webinar section, you will find David's uh, presentation. Or just go to Google and plug in migration from 8 and 16 bit David Donnelly, and it should come up. We also have a follow up uh, webinar on, on an AVR, Atmel AVR. So this, is just, this was the first one. We had a second one with Atmel AVR. And now we're looking with a second, a third NXP part. So it's kind of a, a series of migration webinars going after 8 and 16 bit. OK, so I think uh, these are your slides. Yep, yeah, that's a Yahoo group. That's our YouTube. And we also are on Twitter. We're also on Facebook. So suit, I guess people have different preferences today. But we are pretty much everywhere, all the social networking websites. That's it.